Kirby Planet Robobot is one of the most beloved titles in the series. In fact, it's famous for holding the crown of being the presumably best Kirby game of all time, as many players easily put this 3DS entry on their number one when discussing which representative deserves the crown. For an outsider, this might be quite confusing as the appearance suggests a mere mechanical skin change over Triple Deluxe, the predecessor responsible for fine-tuning Return to Dreamland's formula. The natural assumption to make is claiming Planet Robobot perfected modern Kirby, and it's certainly a sentiment many followers will wholeheartedly agree on. But is this the sole reason for Planet Robobot's beneficial reputation? Before talking about the game as such, let's retrospect the time before release. Being announced and released in only a couple of weeks, at first it seemed like this second mainline entry for the 3DS was done on a whim and should one last time cash grab on a handheld which ought to be obsolete. The industrial coating was a way to quickly recognize the game as a standalone title, apart from Triple Deluxe which already looked fairly similar to Return to Dreamland for the Wii. Of course, the newly added gimmick the robot armor suit was another way to implement a flexible individual factor that should iron out the sluggish momentum-stopping gameplay of Supernova. Still, on the surface it was basically a reskin of two prior games, and despite the fact nothing spoke against the idea, it only shows that Planet Robobot set out to exceed anyone's expectations. The premise in itself is already quite uncommon for Hell and Nintendo in general. Normally, a new mainline title is only justified with the corresponding gimmick feeling either forced or reasonably inventive, creating partners in Superstar, mixing copy abilities in 64, gaining powerful super abilities in Return to Dreamland or swallowing absolutely everything in Triple Deluxe. Those ideas might not be as groundbreaking as the gravity shifting level design of a Mario Galaxy, for instance, but all the more coherent in the realm of what you expect from Kirby. The robot armor suit simply follows the trend of purely seasoning the level design instead of revolutionizing the way a stage is created, and depending on how you perceive this design philosophy, it either rounds the gameplay or makes it stale. There's no denial that Kirby games started to separate their main features into independent sections often placed at the end of a course, while they were luckily optional in Return to Dreamland with some awkward circumventing and on top of that brief to use, Supernova as well as the robot armor suit are necessary to proceed and can overstate their welcome quite quickly. However, the machine is at least a combination of the destructive nature of the super abilities and puzzle solving nature of Supernova, striking a nearly perfect balance between two similar ideas. Whatever the case may be, all of this still doesn't warrant a distinct follow-up theoretically and you cannot shake off the feeling that one of the director's children went into the office and demanded a new Kirby game, but with robots. This is not to say I dislike the idea. Industrial settings are my absolute favorite ambiente when it comes to game worlds and seeing a new mainline entry fully focused on that theming was a dream come true. Nevertheless, and personal bias aside, all of this is still not the reason why Planet Robobot in particular is so highly praised in a franchise that holds the reputation of bearing no bad games. Starting the adventure, it becomes quickly apparent which feature will be used more efficiently than only once before, the camera. Being developed on a console with stereoscopic 3D, the creators naturally wanted to make use of that foundation and increase the the potential of Triple Deluxe left slightly untouched. It was a notion similar to Kirby 64, where three-dimensional worlds led to a far more dynamic perspective, despite only moving from left to right. The console dictates the gameplay and right from the start the first level begins to slowly convey the feeling of depth by swiftly introducing the onset with a lower view but returning to classic Kirby elements. This isn't the only instance where first impressions matter, as you encounter the first boss of the world right at the end with a chasing sequence not seen in the series before. A neat touch is the option to actually beat your foe, but unfortunately it sets the stone for expectations the game didn't feel necessary to meet. The appearance of Clanky Woods is of course nothing breathtaking, but simply surprising and played with the conventions of what you would expect from the genre. Usually Kirby games, especially the traditional ones, follow a very formulaic structure and rarely deviate from established rules. Look no further than Star Allies, which broke those rules 
by constructing a natural flow of events, with boss fights appearing mid-world or no fixed themes for the levels. It would have been nice to see a similar treatment in Planet Robobot, but it's hard to complain about such a nitpick when everything else looks visually stunning. The robotic motif mixed with casual Kirby landscapes result in one of the most stylistic graphics, not only for the franchise but the 3DS as such. Despite sharing the same engine, you can clearly tell this game apart from Triple Deluxe and Return to Dreamland, which was necessary to compensate the general identical gameplay. Still, the certain Kirby touch is maintained by sprinkling in food themes and making use of robotic sounding melodies fused with classic Kirby fanfare. Putting it cynically, Planet Robobot disguises the fact it's simply more of the same, generally speaking, by putting on a color swap. Of course, everyone who played the game knows this is only the truth to some extent, but it also proves how much a visual overhaul can do for the identity of a game. No one describes this entry as triple deluxe, but robots, where instead it overshadows its predecessors nearly completely. Part of the reason is the excellent level design, which borrows the same interaction of back and foreground as before and goes beyond that. The robot armor suit is directly incorporated by switching its appearance depending on what ability is used. This results in charming callbacks, not coming across as plain fan service or complete flexible combinations of established but freshly painted skills. Unfortunately, this cannot be said about the bosses, which mostly consist of known enemies and reappearing fights. Meta Knight is barely different from any encounter in past games, repeated twice, and the second boss isn't even original in the slightest. In a series known for their outstanding creative bosses, it was quite disappointing to see how plain most of them ultimately were. All of this is reconciled, however, by the wonderful final, taking inspiration from all those shmup sections and turning it into the climax. Refine everything with some bittersweet lore behind the characters and you get the perfect recipe for a memorable conclusion. This may also be the cause why the regular bosses are not talked about. If your game starts and ends on a high note, everything in between will be forgiven as long as you are left with an everlasting impression. Sadly, even the robot armor suit is not used to its full potential as there is only one special fight dedicated to the gimmick, whereas even Supernova used more encounters against enemies, despite lacking physical combat abilities. For a feature with more aggressive flexibility than ever before, it would have been great to fight more robotic monstrosities, slowly taking them apart and have a more grandiose feeling than battling a standard Kirby. The reason why I am so harsh with the robot armor suit in comparison to Supernova or the super abilities is the natural direction each of those feel gravity to. I never had the impression Supernova aims to establish bosses, as there's only one way to use it, lacking any kind of more flexibility. The same goes for super abilities, and despite the fact it's a one-hit destructive flow, they made use of them as good as their super abilities allow themselves to be utilized, which ultimately cannot be said about the robot armor suit. All of this shows that even Planet Robobot still consists of some flaws despite being overall outstanding. Most of the time when games are beloved by the vast majority of players, contrarians like to dramatize their downsides by pointing out they are not superb and overrated. Of course, all of them have their drawbacks, the higher you aim, the greater the potential to fall, and it should be admirable to magnificently build upon the foundation created before Breath of the Wild and the very first Legend of Zelda, Paper Mario 1 and the Thousand Year Door, Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze, or in our case, Triple Deluxe and Planet Robobot, prove the benefit of sticking to a formula and see seasoning it to its peak. It may sound effortless to plainly continue with something that worked before, but this can also become a flop if not done right. Self-evidently, I only scratched the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Planet Robobot's strengths. There are many, many features I haven't really mentioned, but this video was not about dissecting the game completely. As you can probably tell, there is not a single trait to point at to describe why Planet Robobot is so beloved. It's a mixture of past efforts, but if I would have to determine one, it would be the simple mechanical color swap. It's a vast departure from the capricious setting of Triple Deluxe and was only used very sparely in the past, which is why it was a delight to observe an industrial planet pop. Normally, this is only something you see in fan fictions, but at the end, I'm glad they spent the 3DS one last swan song with one of the most easily made but terrific Kirby titles in the series.